Well, good morning and welcome to First St. Paul's this beautiful morning. It's a little bit chilly out there. Is the sound okay? We change mics every once in a while, so I just want to make sure. Okay. Um, my name is Chad Power. I'm the Children's and Family Ministry Director here, but I'm also a seminarian, and Pastor Joel is out of town, so I get the opportunity to preach this weekend. So, And I'm thankful that he's out of town because Illinois kind of shed a little light on Nebraska football yesterday, and Joel's an Illinois fan, so I can wait till he gets back to hear the comments. So, um, uh, This week, there are a few announcements that I want to make sure we touch base on. Uh, Thank you for wearing your masks. Again, we're in this time of COVID and it's required that we're wearing masks in the services and at all times. And um, please continue to do that. The, uh, this week is Thanksgiving and on Wednesday night, we do not have any of our normal um, ministry activities. We are going to have a Thanksgiving Eve service. The Thanksgiving Eve service will be in here at seven o'clock. The one thing that we are asking is that if you are planning to attend Thanksgiving Eve service, please call the church office and reserve a spot. Uh, Jody and Alexa are trying to fill out a grid with names of families and how many people are going to be here so that we can make sure we have enough seating and that we have placement for everybody for Thanksgiving Eve. This is also a dry, dry test run for us because during the Advent season and the Christmas Eve services, we are going to have to do reservations as well. So keep that in mind. But if you are planning to attend this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for Thanksgiving Eve, please call Jody and Alexa and um, let them know how many people will be in your family um, attending that day. Uh, we are also looking for anybody that has special gifts with media. If you'd like to be a part of our media team, not only for the contemporary service, but we also have media people that are here on all of our traditional services doing videos and other things, um, please let me know, or Dale Schultz. We are going to have a training on December 1st at 6 o'clock, and we are going to follow social distancing and all the guidelines for that. But. Um, that's on Wednesday night, or it's on a Tuesday night, December 1st. As you walked in, you probably saw a wall of pallets with a bunch of green, black, and gold envelopes on them. This is um, a substitute fundraiser for our mission teams that are going to Arizona and Jamaica next year. Uh, because we are not able to do pancake feeds, soup suppers, and things like that, uh, this is an alternative to their fundraising efforts. And if you'd like, please pick up an envelope, and inside there, there's a little white sheet that asks you to sign your names and give us some information like email or phone number so that we can stay in touch with you throughout the mission trip um, process and keep you up to date on what's going on. But if you would please, uh, and if you feel so moved to uh, give some uh, fun, funds towards the mission trips, that's what that wall of money is about out there for our mission team. So um, there are a few other announcements in the bulletin. Um, please take a look at those. But if you would please stand. The peace of Christ be with you. Share that peace from a safe distance, please. Good morning, Donna. And we will continue with the order of confession and forgiveness as printed in your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and con consolation, come to the help of your people. Turn us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us join in our opening hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord.
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, praise you for your glory, Lord God of Let us join in the prayer of the day. O oh God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for this morning's lessons. The first reading for today comes from the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 34. We begin with verse 11. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. 
and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant, David, shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The psalm reading comes from Psalm 95 today, and we begin with verse 1. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to the Lord with palms. For you, Lord, are a great God and a great ruler above all gods. In your hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also yours. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. And the second reading comes from Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the ages to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all, over all things for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And we begin with verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the found foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it? that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer to him, Lord, 
When was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us uh, please be seated and let's join in our next hymn, Jesus Shall Reign. Well, good morning again, and I truly am thankful this weekend that Pastor Joel was not here with the Illinois game. Um, He usually has a comment or two whenever Nebraska plays Illinois, but yesterday was probably his favorite day. We'll see. He's actually on his way back. He went to um, the east and picked up Ben, and they were driving back, and they were picking up Justin in Illinois. They're leaving Illinois today and headed back, so he was in Illinois enjoying enjoying the game with the Huskers, which was probably a good place for him to be. Um, Yeah, but we'll uh, please keep him in his prayers as they travel today uh, on this holiday and have hopefully their family home for the whole Thanksgiving week, so. This week's passages were a little bit challenging for me to, to take a look at. Um, when you look at the gospel and you look at Matthew, you, you see that the story is talking about judgment, the judgment of all of the saints and the non-saints. And this is a difficult passage to wrap your head around because it's uh, multifaceted. And we're gonna touch on a couple of things today, but one of the things I wanna turn our attention to is that this is actually the end of the year. This is the last Sunday in our liturgical calendar. This is the end of the church calendar. Next week we begin the new church year with the first week of Advent. And so this week of Thanksgiving, when we celebrate this Thanksgiving holiday, a lot of us turn our attention to the things that we've been thankful for over the last year. And we, we begin to think back to anything that's had an impact on our lives. Um, We do evaluate things and also kind of judge the things that have been going on in our lives. So I felt it was kind of um, 
in line with today's scripture to think that we're ending our liturgical calendar, we're celebrating Thanksgiving, we're thinking about the things we're thankful for, but we're kind of judging where we're at in life. A lot of times when we do that, we look at where our family status is at, what we're doing health-wise, the safety, the prosperity that we have in our lives. We start to think of all those things that we're thankful for, and we start to judge those things. And that's where we start to talk about our lesson today. And I hope you don't mind, I'm a a visual learner, so I like to see the scriptures and the words in front of me when we're talking about them. So I'm gonna put a few things up on the screen today and kind kind of break apart not only Matthew, but our reading from Ephesians today because they kind of weave together. And in Matthew, it starts out that all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Now we'll get to that in a little bit, but I wanna flash back a little bit to last week when Pastor Joel's sermon, he was actually speaking about the parable of the talents, which is the section of Matthew right before we get to this judgment of nations. And if you think about what Joel was saying last week, in the parable of the talents, he was talking about God giving the gifts to people, variable variable gifts to people, and how we use them. Do we hide them and bury them? Or do we invest them in the people and the, the, the things that are going on around us? One of the sayings I came across this week when I was reading, I was thinking about this. After Joel told us, how are we using, he challenged us, what are we doing with our gifts? I started to think, God gives us these gifts, not for us to hold on to and bury like the one servant did with a talent, but to use those, to re-gift them, to use them in our lives. But how do we go about doing that? And how is that part of the judgment from our Matthew scripture today? So as we dig into this, let us pray before we start to dive into it. Please join me in prayer. Lord, please open our hearts and minds to your lesson through these scriptures. Help us to be aware of the blind spots we have in our lives. Help us to become the faithful servants you want us to be, caring for all your children with the genuine love you provide for us each day. Please guide my words our thoughts and understandings of your glorious, grace-filled judgment, forgiveness, and righteousness. Amen. So when I was thinking about what Joel told us last week about the gifts and not burying our gifts and, and using those and regifting those to others, I started thinking about what those gifts mean to the kingdom. And you'll notice in the scripture today, that God refers back to the kingdom that's there for those that are blessed. And how do we in our daily lives go about thinking about kingdom? And I ran across in one of my devotions this week a story about a place called the Jekyll Island Club of 1886. All right, a show of hands. How many people have heard of the Jekyll Island Club of 1886? A couple of you, awesome, that's great. <clears throat> this, is, this was new to me this week. I'd never heard of it. Back in 1886, there was a group of, of families, and I'll throw out a few of the names here in a little bit, that uh, decided that they wanted to have a resort, a family area that they could go to and they could hunt and they could just gather to have some relax and downtime. And uh, so these, these people bought this island off the shore of Georgia and it's called Jekyll Island. They bought the island, they built a resort out there and they founded this group called the Jekyll Island Club. Some of the names of the people that were in the Jekyll Island Club, 
You may recognize a few of them. The Goodyear family was there. Rockefellers, Pulitzer, Vanderbilt, J.P. Morgan's family, Macy's, Gould, Crane, Astor. In all, the members of the Jekyll Hyde Club controlled one-sixth of the world's wealth at that time. They built this kingdom for them to enjoy. One of the things that happened on Jekyll Island, the first transcontinental phone call from the president to the east and the west coast was at Jekyll Island, where the president of AT&T was staying at the time, and so he jumped onto the phone call at that time. These families used this resort as their getaway, their kingdom, this earthly kingdom. But because they were connected, they, be, they were the most powerful, wealthy, and influential group ever known. And it was on this earthly kingdom that they built this group. They built their own earthly kingdom. They had influences. Um, J.P. Morgan, I think once, maybe twice, actually helped the U.S. government out by giving them a loan financially during this time period. So this is how wealthy this group was. And they built this kingdom so that they could interact and be together. You know what happened to their kingdom? By 1942, what happened? World War I and World War II. World War II was the end of it. The Jekyll Island Club kind of just dismantled and was deserted. This earthly kingdom where these most powerful people were living and interacting and engaging in world affairs was now nothing. But now, 1987, some investors have rebuilt it. And that's, it's a resort. It's not like it was before with all the financial wealth and power that's behind it, but it's more of a resort. And if you want to go there, this is the new, new resort on 2017 out at the, the shores of Georgia off of the ocean. But when I started thinking about kingdoms, you think about one-sixth of the world's wealth and the families coming together and the influence that they had on this earth. And in less than 50 years, it fell apart. And now it's being put, put back together as a resort. I started to wonder, as we started looking at our scripture, what type of kingdom are we striving to inherit? And in this section of Matthew, verses 32 through 46, God is telling us what he's looking for. Now, you've got to be careful, though. When you come into chapters 34 and 36, there's a lot of information that is thrown out here. But you have to understand what, what God, what Jesus is saying. First of all, when we think about Judgment Day, everybody thinks about God being the, the, the Father on the throne that's, that's judging us. In Matthew, the judge is Jesus, his son. And what does Jesus do as the shepherd? He separates the sheep from the goats. And he puts the sheep at his right hand, he puts the goat at his left hand. Sheep at that time, biblical time, were more valuable. They were, the, they were the blessed ones. The goats were not so valuable, so they were over here on the left. Right hand of Jesus, left hand of Jesus. Sheep, goats, he's sorting them out. Based off of what? Wouldn't we all love to know that? Well, it's right here. Matthew 25, 34 through 36 reads, Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom, the eternal kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. 
This is a list of six things. Some people refer to them as deeds. Some people refer to them as good works. Here Jesus lists six good works that the saints that he has put on his right hand as sheep have followed and done. And he's recognized that. Now, as good Lutherans, we know that we cannot earn our salvation based off of good works and good deeds. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing and a little bit challenging sometimes. But what Jesus is doing here is he's telling you that these are the things that he's seen the saints, and this is why he separated them out as the sheep. If you look at each one of those six things, you gave me food, you gave me something to drink, you welcomed me, you gave me clothing, you took care of me, you visited me. Each one of these valuable things that Jesus is judging the saints on is something that is not dependent on wealth, it's not dependent on your ability, and it's not dependent on your intelligence. It's something that each and every person can do without having any of those three things. It's the genuine heart. These are freely given gifts that we freely receive and can use for everyone's purpose around us. Jesus goes on as he looks at 37 and 39. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we did these things? So if you read through these next few verses, the saints are asking, when did we do these, Lord? We, never, we don't remember seeing you. We don't remember giving you clothes. We don't remember feeding you. We don't remember giving you something to drink. We don't even remember visiting you when you were in prison. The saints are saying, when did we do these things? And what was Jesus' reply? Jesus replied, it wasn't that you did them to me. You did them to the least, to the members of my family. And when you did it to them, you did it to me. So this is the challenging part. The sheep that Jesus has separated out to the right, the ones that he's going to give eternal life to, did all of those things, but they didn't even know it. They did it because it came from the heart. It came from a Christian heart filled with the Holy Spirit guiding them, and they didn't even have to think about it the intentionality of those actions wasn't a checklist of things that we tried to accomplish or do. It was something we did and we do out of the goodness of our heart because Jesus is leading us and guiding us in the way to live. It's the intentionality of those deeds or works that Jesus recognizes. They didn't think about it. They didn't do it because it's a list of things we have to check off. They did it because it was the right thing to do. And it was from their heart. So how does Ephesians fit into this? Ephesians is a letter that Paul has written to the church of Ephesus. And in a letter back in the biblical times, they had a certain form and a structure that they would use, just like we do today. How do we start our letters out? Probably, hello, or a text message or an email. Hey, this is Chad. Hey, Paul did the salutation. He did that, but then they always followed up with a prayer for whoever they have writing to. So you get the salutation, and this in verse 16 in Ephesus 1 is Paul's prayer. And listen to what he says. I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the work of his great power. Paul is intentionally in his prayer telling the saints in the church of Ephesus, we know God, we know Jesus, and through knowing him, our heart's eye is opened. We are enlightened so that our heart will lead all of our actions. And through that eye of our heart, those actions will help us to see the riches that God has given to us in the glorious judgment, what Matthew is talking about in our passage from the gospel today. Sorry, I've got to get my glasses out here because I've got to read a quote. I'm in my third year of seminary, so I do a lot of reading, and this is one of the, the books that I've read in the last year. It's called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And if you don't know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, he was a martyr. He was killed and imprisoned, imprisoned and killed in a concentration camp because he was a pastor, because he believed in Jesus Christ, and because he stood up to Hitler and the Nazis. And in the closing chapter of this book, he framed it up in a paragraph very well, combining what Matthew was saying with what Paul is saying in his scripture today. And I'm quoting, this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. God alone, God alone knows our good works. All we know is his good work. We can do no more then hearken to his commandment. Carry on and rely on his grace. Walk in his commandments and sin. All the time, our new righteousness, our sanctification, the light which is meant to shine, are veiled from our eyes. The left hand knows not what the right hand does, but we believe and are all are well assured that he which began a good work in you will perfect it until the day Jesus Christ comes. In that day, Christ will show us the good works of which we were unaware. While we knew it not, we gave him food, drink, and clothing, and visited him, and while we knew it not, we rejected him as well. Great will be our astonishment in that day, and we shall then realize that it is our works which remain but the work which God has wrought through us in his good time without any effort of will and intention on our part. Once again, we simply are to look away from ourselves to him who has himself accomplished all things for us and to follow him, Jesus Christ. Even an imprisoned concentration camp, Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew that his actions were following Jesus' Christ's lead. He didn't do them because he intentionally wanted or felt that he needed to do them. He did them because he was a Christian and he knew that it was the Christ thing from his heart to do. So on this week of Thanksgiving, as we celebrate and think back to the things we're thankful for in our lives, the things that we've, we've done, the things that have gone through our families and our, in our lives, I challenge you to open your heart. Not just open your heart, but fully open your heart to Jesus Christ. When we do that, we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. Then our actions the deeds or the good works that Jesus is looking for are natural. We don't have to work at it. They're the things that God fills us with. 
And when I think about that, I think about 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And that's what Paul is talking about in Ephesians. And that's what Matthew is talking about in the last judgment of the nations, is that we look and we act from our heart. The enlightened heart, eye of our heart. And as we close, I would like to close and look at Paul's prayer once again because it's so fitting for us at this time. I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I'm thankful for each of you, each and every day. I pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him with an enlightened eye of your heart treating others the way God and Jesus Christ treats us every day with the heart of love. Amen. Let us now join in the hymn, Rejoice for Christ is King. And please stand. Please join me in confessing the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Sovereign of all, train our ears to hear your cry in the needs of those around us. Bless all social ministries of the church through which we seek to serve others as we ourselves have been served. 
Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You cause rain to fall on the just and unjust alike. Direct our use of creation to provide the needs of all people in ways that are sustainable for the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bring peace to every place where conflict rages. Grant opportunities for ending divisions among us and usher in your reign of unity and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. For those in need, for those who face a scarcity of resources, and for those who struggle with debt, for all who suffer with chronic pain, all who grieve, and all who are ill, especially D. Cometcher's mother and Chad Power's father, hear us, O God. Also be with Henry and Marva Potts, the family on the loss of their sister-in-law, Joe. This time is not easy to lose a loved one, and we pray that you give them your strength and your peace as they mourn. Lord, in your mercy. Pour out the gifts of your spirit on children and youth throughout the church. Sustain those who work in ch children's ministry, youth ministry, and campus ministry as they nurture the gifts of young people. Hear us, O God. And thank you for saints now departed who fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and tended to the sick. Inspire us by their example that we may see your presence in those in need around us. Hear us, O God. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Please rise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Let us sing, Lift High the Cross.
and go in peace and serve the Lord. And please allow the ushers to escort.